Shabbat Shalom. All right, here's what we're going to do. I don't know, from my end, I can't see the chat um, on Zoom, so I don't know where it is, or if you guys can see something I can't see, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that works. But what we'll do is, uh, while I'm getting ready, there's a couple of things I'd like for you to have on hand. I would have put that in the chat box, but I don't see it to use it. So a um, couple of things to have on hand. If you would have your Bible, turn to chapter 33 of Deuteronomy. Your Bible, turn to chapter 33 of Deuteronomy. And then also have marked or somehow, you know, where you can get to it really fast, Proverbs 31. We're going to do something fun. I'm going to show you some parallels between the blessings on the sons of Jacob, on the sons of Israel, and the, the matching blessings that you can find in Proverbs 31. And we always call her the Proverbs 31 woman. Uh, but there's some things to know about the book of Proverbs that, that might modify exactly what we expect of women. <laughs> When, when we compare them to what's in Proverbs 31, that might be a higher bar than, than a flesh and blood woman can actually aspire to. All right, so again, your toolkit for this lesson is going to be a Bible. You want to have it turn to chapter 33 of Deuteronomy. You want to be able to access Proverbs 31 quickly. And you might want to have a pencil. Pen's fine. I, I just, I make a lot of mistakes, as you can see by the size of this eraser. And so when I make notes and things, uh, it helps me a little bit to have a pencil uh, instead of a pen. But sometimes a pen's easier to read. So personal preference there, just so you can take some notes. I think you'll, this will be one of these things where you don't want to just listen. You actually want to have something in your hand to take notes with. Okay. All right. So if you've got your Bible, if you've got your pencil, if you've got a sheet of paper or something to make some notes on, what we want to do is a little bit of review from, was it last week? Yeah, I guess it was last week, um, where we've been looking at the blessings of the tribe of Asher. The tribe of Asher, and I'm always looking, making sure Asher doesn't run in here when he hears his name. And here where you want to say Asher, Asher, the tribe of Asher, because there's a, a special, um, of course, each tribe has its own special blessing, but there's a special aspect to the tribe of Asher that sometimes we miss if we're not using good Bible study tools. And of course, our, our Bible study tools, uh, they fall under the heading of the big word hermeneutics, hermeneutics. And it sounds way more scary than it is. Hermeneutics is just tools that help you to study the Bible, help you to unpack what you're reading so that you don't get off on the wrong track. Yeshua used these rules. The apostles use these rules. The writers of the Old Testament, you can see them following these rules. Uh, and so if you just know a few of them, it, it can make you much more accurate when you're trying to figure things out, especially on your own. And you really shouldn't ever <laughs> believe that you can somehow figure out the whole Bible on your own. There's, there's problems associated with that sort of mindset. Uh, and that the thing that we find out is the longer we study the Bible is the more difficult it is, uh, the more we need scholars uh, to give us other points of view, the more we need good rules of hermeneutics, the more we need to study our Hebrew. And that's the caution with Hebrew is, you know what, you study Hebrew a few years and you're way more dangerous than when you didn't know a word of Hebrew. That's the oddity of it, because you know just enough Hebrew to be dangerous. 
And that's even our way in the Torah. You know, your first three years in the Torah, you reach a point where, you know what, you will you can't ever know any more than you know right then. And if you can push on past about that three-year stage, that's when you realize, well, I don't know anything. You, you, you can go pretty fast from, gee, I must know everything there is to know about the Torah to, I don't know the first thing about the Torah. And the longer you study the Torah, the less you realize you know the Torah. And um, so it's kind of the same way with Hebrew. You're way more dangerous with a little bit of Hebrew than you are with no Hebrew. Or, uh, you know, if, if you continue, at least if, if you know that you're out of your element in terms of biblical Hebrew, so I'm way more proficient with modern Hebrew. Uh, speaking Hebrew, talking to people in Hebrew than I am with biblical Hebrew. I only had two semesters of biblical Hebrew. Do they cross over? To an extent, they do. Uh, just like Shakespearean English can be understood by someone who speaks modern English. It's just we have to work at it a little bit harder. Um, even the grammatical structure is a little bit different. The syntax is a little bit different, but you can figure it out. You're, you're speaking the same language. Um, would a modern English speaker say, understand Chaucer? Probably not. <laughs> there, there is a breaking point. But fortunately, with modern and ancient Hebrew, the, the, the points are pretty close together. If you can understand one, one, you can understand the other. It's just a matter of resetting your, your syntax in a lot of cases. Uh, but uh, with the Hebrew, you know, like I say, it comes a big caution too, because Hebrew is such a multi-purpose language. There can be so many meanings to a Hebrew word, and ultimately, you have to know the context. If you don't know the context, you don't really know which meaning of that word is being used in that particular case. Uh, but if we apply these rules, like the rule of first mention the rule of progressive mention, the rule of complete mention. If we pay attention to something Yeshua loved to use, which is, uh, is called kal v'chumer in Hebrew, it means light and heavy. If this is true, then how much more would this be true? It's taking this example and then applying that same template to this example, which would have a heavier weight to it. And for him, it was a, often... Yeshua's arguments often fell into, I don't want to call them a gray zone because it's really black and white when it comes to obedience or disobedience. But when it comes down to doctrine, sometimes how we apply those doctrines, we may both agree that we should be doing that thing or we should not be doing that thing. But it's in these gray areas where I see it this way and you see it that way. Even though we both agree that the Bible is true 100% we should be doing or not doing. It's how we derive the, the um, practical practice, right? Um, orthopraxis is what it's called. If we want to use a big word, how do we actually practice this? We might have a wide variety. Um, and the, the rabbis say that's probably one reason that the, the people ask Moses, you go listen to what Adonai has to say, and then you come back and tell us. Because if he tells the whole nation, we're going to walk away from this mountain with millions of interpretations of Ten Commandments. Millions, because there were millions of them standing there. We'll walk away with millions of interpretations of what that means and how it's going to be applied practically. So Moses, you learn it then you come teach it to us and tell us how it's supposed to be applied. And, and that way we won't have the, the chaos reigning in the camp. And so with that understanding, this is what we're doing. We want to apply some rules here and say there is such a thing as progressive mention. And so if I read about something over here, if I find a similar situation over here, then I will have more understanding of this second situation based on what I've already read in the first situation. It may not be identical, but the template is there. In the same way, there might be some things about the first example that I don't really understand, but now he gives me this second example. 
and I can go back to the first one and now I can read that with much more clarity. And so comparing similar uh, contexts, that's part of progressive mention. You just keep reading and you keep adding um, to your examples. And that's what we want to do today. We want to compare two sections of scripture that maybe, I don't know if anybody's ever done it before or not. Uh, this is out of one of the workbooks, by the way. Um, so where did you get that? Well, this is out of um, Creation Gospel Workbook 5, Volume 5. Workbook 5, Volume 5, which of course will be over Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy. And I believe it's in the last lesson, if I'm not mistaken, because this blessing is in the last Torah portion. So let's, let's just give a little background before we start doing our exercise here. Um, do this. This is our text that we've been working with in our Footsteps of Messiah. Uh, we know that the Song of Songs uh, is prophecy, not just of the return of Messiah, but of the relationship between Israel and the Messiah. And so this section in uh, Song of Songs, which is, which is Shir Hashirim, uh, chapter four, this is what we call the twins and pairs passage. There are so many twins and pairs that we've studied over the last several weeks, even months. Um, and, and so our examples in here, it really drives you back to the pairs, the twins and the pairs of things. And um, one of the sections that we looked at had to do with uh, similarities between Abraham and Sarah, how their blessings were almost identical. I gave you some other things, for instance, uh, a comment that David makes comparing his army, those in his army who went to the front and ultimately defeated the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and then those who stayed back to protect what's called the baggage. Because with most armies, it's your baggage that makes up the bulk uh, of what's happening, because you have to be able to supply those people on the front lines to resupply them, um, medical care, all sorts of stuff. You need to protect your equipment in the back as it's being brought up, you know, as uh, you don't have all your bullets on the front line, you can't carry them like that, but you need to protect those stores of ammunition and so forth. Same way in ancient times as it is today. So it's just as important to protect what's there for resupply or protection as it is to be on the front line. Because, um, you know, if you lose the baggage or if you lose the supply area, then there's no way to supply the front lines. And so when the, some of the soldiers on the front lines complained that David was going to divvy up everything after the battle and give equally to the men who protected the baggage, it says nobody's going to listen to you. It doesn't matter whether you went to the front lines or whether you stayed with the baggage. Everybody gets paid the same. And then we saw in Psalm 68 that the exact same statement is made of this female army. Um, and it's definitely female. When you read it in Hebrew, there is a female army being referred to. You know, it's a great host. Uh, she who proclaims the good news is a great army. But then it says, uh, she who stays at home will divide the spoil. So the implication is the same as what David was saying is we'll, we're going to send people out with the good news. But if you're staying home with your children, you're nurturing your children, you're building your home, you share and share alike in whatever loot there might be. I don't know what the loot would be to proclaiming the good news, but you're going to share in the word the same as is those who are out there doing the hand-to-hand -hand combat, should there be that, of, of preaching the gospel. There's no difference. And so as you go through scripture, you find passages like that where we tend to notice the, the masculine examples of things. And because there aren't so many 
uh, feminine examples of those same things. Sometimes when we do read them, we're not expecting to see them. So we just read right through them. We don't really make that connection between what King David said and then what was said in Psalm 68. Uh, we don't always put Abraham and Sarah's blessings side by side to see how close they are. And so in this case, we have an opportunity to take the blessings of the 12 sons and Deuteronomy and compare them to the blessings on this Proverbs 31 woman and see how similar they are. They're, they're really like reading two versions of the same thing. What do we know about Proverbs 31? We know that the book of Proverbs is a parable of the Holy Spirit. It's a parable of the Holy Spirit. That's why I say, don't, don't, ladies, don't put that much pressure on yourself. You can't do everything in Psalm 31. Or if you could, you know, kohakavo, <laughs> you're quite a woman. But it's a parable of the Holy Spirit. And it's personified as a woman, just like other things, just like the spirit of Adonai in the book of Proverbs is personified as a woman who's crying out wisdom. She's crying out understanding and counsel and so forth. So it's the power of the Holy Spirit that is being attached to the daughters in Proverbs 31. And it is, is giving a balance here. And that's why I say we don't necessarily expect to see it in the context of the blessing on the sons. But remember what we learned about the tribe of Asher. When we did the lion lesson, when we did the lion lesson, we saw the, the three examples of three types of lions that were prophesied as Judah, as the lion cub, as the lion, the male lion, and then as the lioness. And we compared that to our growth in the feasts from the one who's nursing on milk to the grown up lion to the lioness who can now reproduce herself. She can now bring forth more cubs and then she can also nurse with the milk. She starts a new cycle of learning, just like we start a new cycle of the feasts each year. We start a new cycle of scripture reading each year. So it's representing this growth to maturity, but not just growth to maturity, but reminding us that we start a new path to maturity each year in its cycle. Okay. And so that kind of takes us back to uh, the pairs and twins passage that we've been studying in the footsteps of Messiah. If we want to listen for the footsteps of Messiah in our generation, and I don't know if ours is the last generation or if it is a last generation. Yes. Clearly, the apostles thought they were in the last days. Clearly, they were taking even Yeshua's statements that way, that it was right there. And technically, if you look in the rabbinic literature, we are in the days of Messiah. The last 2,000 years have been the days of Messiah. They've got it sectioned off into three sections. So they weren't wrong. We are in the days of Messiah right now but we are looking for his return. So as we're listening for his footsteps on the mountains, we want to learn to tune our ears so that we'll know when those footsteps approach, what it should sound like. Well, one of the things we can refer to as we're tuning our ears is go back to Acts chapter two. Remember Yeshua has just ascended, told the, the disciples do not leave Jerusalem until Shavuot, keep the commandment, it's something very important is going to happen. And one of the most fascinating things about the whole Acts chapter 2 incident is the scripture that Peter chose to first explain it. He says, this is what the prophet Yoel spoke about. I will pour out my spirit on your sons and your daughters, on your male and your female servants. There was something about what happened there in the house, which we take to be the temple. It's a, it's a metaphor for the temple. They were probably gathered around the area of Solomon's porch, which is where Yeshua and his disciples liked to hang out when he was teaching. And the numbers that were converted tells us that they were not in an upper room. They had moved from, you know, the, the setting has changed from chapter one to chapter two. Uh, but they're still in one heart. They're, they're still of one accord as they're praying at the Feast of Shavuot. And of course, the cloven tongues of fire fall which they would, I'm sure, have had the, the 
formation of a Hebrew letter sheen, which stands for fire. And it is a cloven tongue of fire when you look at it, the, the letter itself. So Peter thought the twins and the pairs were an important thing to reference. If you want to know what's happening, he said, if, if you want to understand why this gospel is being proclaimed to you in your own tongue, then you need to discern your time. And the time that it is, he says, the time for the spirit to be poured out on the sons and the daughters, the male and the female servants. It's time for the, the twins and pairs to be recognized for their purposes. That male and female, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And I think this, we can attribute much of our current confusion on gender to this very phenomenon. Because when the spirit is trying to do something holy and pure and fulfill prophecy, then the confusion of the adversary always comes in alongside it. It will always bring something in alongside it that is a distraction, and it will actually hold some element, some tiny element of the truth in it. And there is a tiny element of truth. It's that uh, you know, like Paul was telling the Corinthians, uh, there's male things, there's female things, but they're both prophesying of something. The man, by his head, he is prophesying of the restoration of the kingdom of heaven on earth. The woman with her head is prophesying of the restoration of the rule of mankind under King Yeshua on earth. They're, they're representing two different things. And you need both of those things in the congregation. That's why he says, if you're going to pray or prophesy in public, do it this way. Have, ladies, have your head covered this way. Men, you shouldn't have anything hanging down over your heads like a woman. You have to read that back into the Greek to understand what he's saying. He's not saying don't wear a head cover, men. You probably should be wearing a head cover if you're going to pray or prophesy publicly, just like the, the priests, the Levites, they wouldn't go into the temple precincts with their heads uncovered. That, that, was, that put you under suspicion of sin. When your head was uncovered, it, it was a sign of, oh my goodness, you know, they might have leprosy. We have to uncover their head till there's a diagnosis made here. Now we live in a different time period. We do. So we, we have to kind of look to that time period and say, okay, what does it mean today? But in the time at which Paul is writing, men did. They would have something on their heads when they, when they went into a holy precinct. They just wouldn't wear a head covering like a woman, which is what he's telling the Corinthians. Don't wear something hanging down on your head. That's a feminine. See, you do have to look at the culture. What says feminine? Something hanging down on your head. Be masculine. Women, be feminine. He's saying, you know, wear the feminine head covering because it's your job to prophesy in the congregation of the restoration of mankind, the restoration of that rule on earth as it was originally intended. Well, the male over here is prophesying of the restoration of Adonai's rule on earth. You are prophesying of the restoration of mankind's rule over the earth, that it was a originally conceived as a partnership. And so it takes both of you to prophesy of this partnership of heaven and earth. Okay. Um, so the, the twins and the pairs go way back is what Peter's saying. This is a sign of that Yeshua is restoring all things. He, he didn't come to keep us in a curse. He didn't come to put us in a curse. He came to restore us from the curse. And so part of that process was restoring this concept of the twins and the pairs of this, because they were both created to rule over the creation. It wasn't that he was to rule and she wasn't. It, it, we have to read the text. They were to rule together over the creation. And so this was a restoration of that aspect that was distorted, diminished, all things done to it when we fell out of the garden. And, you sh and uh, Peter is saying, Yeshua came to guide us back, to prepare us to go back into the garden and to take upon ourselves the roles that we were created to have. And in the congregation, there's no better place than to begin rehearsing the restoration 
of those roles of a royal priesthood. Um, and so like I said, when you see the women mentioned, clearly it's not gonna be as frequently. Um, what we can't deny is the examples are there. And it's just like spirit things. We tend not to pay attention to spirit things and we look at the natural things and we say, sports are more real than spiritual things. Government, politics are more real than spiritual things. Uh, games are more real than spiritual things. Head knowledge is more real than spiritual things. The medical system is more real than spiritual things. But in the realm that we are designated to, that we are being restored to, that's not the truth. The spirit is every bit as real in that realm as the natural things, that which can be observed with the natural eye, the natural ear, the natural touch. The spirit will once again uh, carry the weight of authority that it used to. Because we can't observe the spirit very easily, we tend to look over it. And so I think that's often the pattern when we look at women in scripture, when we see, well, their, their examples are much fewer, but the power of the spirit that's attached to prophetesses like Sarah or Deborah or Hulda or Miriam. Yes, not so much in our natural minds, in our natural understanding, but very much in our spiritual understanding. We do bear witness to them. And so um, from that, you know, and I want to pull now out of this idea that the blessing on Asher was the blessing of daughters. Said so he will be blessed from sons. He will be blessed from sons. Well, what do we know? Eve was taken from Adam, and she was created to be a blessing to him. What does the proverb say? He who finds a wife finds a good thing. And he brings down favor from heaven. His, his prayers become uh, more efficient. That's what the proverb says. His prayers actually become more efficient when he's married because it's part of the pattern. And so, yes, it was the, the priestly system male. It was. Women had a share in the sacrifices. They could eat the sacrifices because of their relationship to the priests or the Levites. Uh, but we also see that even though we barely see any mention of it, it's like we're supposed to know this was happening. Uh, Exodus 38, 8. It says, he made the labor of bronze and its base of bronze from the bronze mirrors of the serving women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now, because we don't have any more information than that, we tend to just read through it like, well, it didn't tell me much. What were they doing? What were they serving? How were they serving? I would love to know the answers to that. But scripture, when it's talking about spiritual things, often it will obscure and so the only other place I can find anything matching this other than the Gospels is going to be 1 Samuel 2.22. It says, now Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Well, again, I want to know, what were these women doing at the door of the tabernacle of meeting? There was evidently a whole cadre of women that routinely served at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And we're told absolutely nothing about what they were doing until we reach the gospels, until we reach the gospels. Then finally, we get a little bit of insight as to what these women who served did. We know exactly what the Levites were doing. We know exactly what the priests were doing. It's recorded in great detail. But what were these women doing? And did the father consider it important? He must have because bad things happened to Ailey's son, taking advantage of the women. 
bad things happened to them. And then something bad happened to Ailey because he wouldn't discipline them. He wouldn't rebuke them. He would not bring them to account for this behavior toward the women who were assembling at the Mishkan to serve. All right. So here's the passage that we're working with, uh, the blessing on Asher, which is Deuteronomy 33, 22. Of Asher, he said, may Asher be blessed. And I believe this is, uh, it might be in ASB. With sons, which is Mibanim, he will be pleasing to his brothers and immerse his foot in oil. Your locks are iron and copper, and the days of your old age will be like the days of your youth. Right. And as Uncleos is translating this, uh, you know, it remember at the time of Yeshua, they spoke Aramaic. And so often the synagogue would have a translator who, if they didn't understand the Hebrew, he could translate it into Aramaic. And often in that translation, Uncleos would do what he could to clarify the the statement. And so as Uncleos is translating into Aramaic, which then we have to take back to English, his explanation is the blessing of Asher will be from the blessings of the sons. It will be from the blessings of the sons. It was associated with a blessing on daughters. Uh, Again, it, it takes you back to Adam and Eve, how Eve was taken from Adam that that blessing was taken from Adam. It's a reflection in the twins and the pairs, that, that sort of idea. And the, according to this Jewish viewpoint, the blessing on a share is the ability of the sons to promote ideals of the Torah to his brothers. And if we take Uncleos and, and some other commentators' ideas about this, it might also be the ability of the daughters to promote the living Torah to the brothers. And like I say, it's not until we get into the Gospels that we find out what women might have been doing in the temple or the tabernacle area. Like I say, the it's the, the Torah and the prophets assume we know that something is going on, but we don't know what's going on. Or we have to look in other places to figure out what was happening here. Well, we know that a lady named Anna or Hannah, uh, and it's interesting, there's just a strange intersection here too. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but if you remember, there was another Hannah and Ailey walked up on her praying and he thought she was drunk because she was just moving her lips, but she was praying for a son. She's praying for children. And he blessed her and sent her away. And that child was Samuel. And Samuel is going to step in as the spiritual leader later because of this situation with Ailey and his sons. Exactly. Uh, So uh, Hannah pops up in this story many years back, or, or her name does, so that we can... Uh, also say about her that in Judaism, the the method of the daily prayer is attributed to Hannah when she was praying in the tabernacle and she was just moving her lips. She couldn't really be heard to the point they thought she was drunk. Well, that's how you say the Shemone Yisrei. You just say it barely loud enough to kind of hear yourself. And the point is not for other people to hear you. Uh, now, in a synagogue, they'll have a cantor that you can follow along with, but she is the model of prayer. Well, there's another lady named Hana or Anna, and this is in Luke 2:36 through 38, and I think this explains to us exactly what those women were doing, not just in the tabernacle, but later in the temple as well. It says there was a prophetess, Hana the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. And remember, the the daughters of Asher, from the tribe of Asher, they were highly sought after by both priests and kings. Priests and kings. They weren't just beautiful. They were 
full of the spirit because they say it was because the olive trees that grew in the, the portion of Asher, like the wise woman of Tekoa, they were seen as very wise and full of the spirit as represented by the, the blessing of oil on Asher, of course, oils associated with the spirit and the menorah. So it says she was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fastings and prayers. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and, we, and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Right. So I think that answers our question. Well, who were these women? What were they doing at the door of the tabernacle? Or the, you know, it's it just, tell us more, tell us more. Well, this is the more. This explains exactly what uh, women would be doing who were serving in the temple. Uh, the text tells us that she had been married and uh, she was a widow. And she's already old, and that helps us think of the blessing on Asher. You know, uh, there's some blessings of old age embedded into the tribe of Asher. She's 84 years old, which is old for back then. And apparently, if she's had children, she's already brought them up. And she must have the means at this point. And so she devotes herself to fasting and prayer night and day. And um, She's one of the two that Yeshua is presented to. Remember, there was a, a priest named Shimon that Yeshua is presented to. And then her parents find Hannah. Why did they know to look for Hannah? But she probably had a reputation. She was probably one of these people who, when they pray, things get answered. Because remember, Yeshua said some things come out only by prayer and fasting. There were things he could do that the disciples couldn't do because he had a habit of prayer and fasting. Hannah was working on that template. There were probably answers to her prayers. Remember, it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It has to be effectual and it has to be fervent. When you fast, there's a fervency in your prayer. It says, I mean business. Uh, I'm not mumbling out a prayer as I cram cookies in the side of my mouth. I'm serious about this petition that I'm bringing to you. And this is what she does. She serves night and day in the temple with fasting and prayer. She's looked up to as a, a prayer warrior, an intercessor. She's an important witness. And this is at a time when women were given no credibility in the court. You couldn't take a woman's word in a, in a court. It, it, like women and slaves are in the same category and children. <laughs> Minority children, slaves and women, they could not give testimony in court. But Hannah, what does she do? She starts giving testimony. Once she has borne witness to Yeshua, it says she continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So it didn't matter what kind of laws they wrote writing women out of the, the legal process, the Holy One of Israel wrote her in. He wrote her into the Bible even. But notice it says she's to those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. She didn't tell just anybody, apparently. She was very selective. Um, she <laughs> apparently didn't suffer fools. She had a, a particular type of person that she related to. If you were serious about your spiritual life, probably Hannah was the one that you would want to know, to go to, to listen to. If you weren't serious about your spiritual life, it doesn't sound like she would waste time with you. And I've known people like that. Not a bad thing. We need more of that. <laughs> because we, less, we need less playing with the word. We need less playing with our spiritual lives. So we see that the blessing upon Asher is fulfilled in Hana. She is blessed to see her anointed king. Remember the blessing upon Asher is oil. May he dip his foot in oil. 
And then she begins proclaiming this idea, ideal, which is what the rabbis say was characteristic of Asher, that Asher knew how to proclaim these ideals, these virtuous ideals of prophecy and the word to their brothers and sisters, to those who are looking for redemption. It's like she dipped her foot in the oil of Yeshua's anointing and then shared it. And she's already 84 years old. I would love to know how much longer she proclaimed in her old age. But the blessing says, and the days of your old age will be like the days of your youth. It sounds like nothing changed with Hannah. Even though she was 84, she had always been a righteous woman. And she was a righteous woman till the day she died. You know, talk about a pillar in the temple. She was one of those pillars in the temple. Uh, what he said, uh, he will go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Well, what was she proclaiming? The redemption of Jerusalem, the name of the city of my God, the name, the reputation of the city, the prophecies of the city. So, yes, yeah, she is a pillar in the temple. She doesn't go out from the temple. She's bearing this blessing of, of oil, of anointing, bearing witness to our king, right? So here's our exercise. We'll stop right there for today. And this is where you're invited uh, to find your Bible to be turned there to Deuteronomy 33. Have your pencil and paper if you need it. And we're going to compare the blessings on Israel's sons to Proverbs 31. And we're going we're gonna to slip down to verse 10 in Proverbs 31 because that's where the an excellent wife who can find, remember, uh, the tribe of Asher is the blessing from sons. So we've got the blessings on the sons here in Deuteronomy 33. Now, as we go to Proverbs 31, we are going to see how there is blessing from sons upon the daughter. Right. All right. So let's start. Uh, let me get flipped back here. Let's flip down to chapter 33, verse 6. And which version of the, I don't know which version this is. Yes, this is JPS. Okay, so yours might be a little bit different. And it says, this of Judah. In fact, let me share if I can. Let me see if I can do it. And it might be easier for you to see it. If I let you look at a chart, maybe that'll be easier. All right, let me try to share that. Here we go. All right, that helps because now you've got Deuteronomy 33 on the left. You've got the verse number. You've got the specific points of the blessing there. You got an example. And then as you go over to the right-hand column, you can see Proverbs 31. And there I've given you the verses in Proverbs 31. So if you want to go back later, we're not going to find everything. That's the great thing about having a bunch of people look at one section of scripture. They'll find way more stuff than one person can find. So this might be fun to do with your Bible study with your kids or something. Uh, but let's look here at verse 6. It's very short for Reuven. It says, may Reuven live and not die, though few be his numbers, right? Um, that might be a little bit different than probably the, the version I was using there. But we can see that when we go over here to the Proverbs 31 woman, what do we know? Well, for Reuven, may he live and not die, right? Uh, so we could take that to be a long life. Now, when you say a long life in scripture, it might literally be a long life in the natural realm. 
but uh, like the uh, certain uh, commandments that come with a blessing, like uh, honor your father and mother so that your days will be long on the earth. Well, there's a natural mother and father. And if you honor them, odds are, if you follow their advice and they're righteous people, you will have long life on the earth. But your father and your mother, what about the Holy One of Israel? He's your creator. He's the one who gave life to you. If you honor him, the days of your long life are eternal. Long meaning eternal. So there's two ways. There's two layers of looking at, at long life. One, yes, a natural life. The other being eternal life. Right. So when we see um, may Reuve live and not die, the implication there is eternal life. That's the spiritual application of it. It says, though, few be his numbers. Right. So here's what it says about uh, the, the wife in Proverbs. It says, uh, she does him good and not evil all the days of her life. All the days of her life. If we ask a rabbi, he might say that phrase also means all the days of Messiah. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? All the days of her life. So not just the natural life, but the days of Messiah and even the days of the world to come. So her husband, if, if this is a parable of the Holy Spirit, and we know that it is, then who is her husband? Well, again, as, as you're looking at Israel, filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit and the bride say come. They're seen as one thing. Is it the Spirit or is it the bride? Yes. Yes. Remember the twins and the pairs. And so we have Yeshua and we have the bride, Israel. We have the Proverbs 31 woman filled with the Holy Spirit saying come to the bridegroom. And what does she do? She does good all the days of her life to her bridegroom. Not just during the days of Messiah, but the life of the world to come. Uh, it says in verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. I think that's based on a, a version that I had that talks about um, where Reuven would be counted. Let him be counted. Uh, and that's kind of the problem when you do this with different versions, you might not pick up something that's that's getting you closer back into the, the Hebrew. Um, and so being included there is the theme. And even though there's not much said about Reuven at all, number one, he's, he's mentioned first, which is an honor. Um, these tribes will be switched around based on the context. What is the message that's being portrayed, you might see them switched around some. It's not to diminish any other tribe, but it's to, to show you the significance of that particular placement. So in this particular placement, Reuven, even though he messed up by moving Jacob's bed, he's still honored as the firstborn in these blessings by Moses. Uh, even being placed ahead of Judah in this particular uh, list of blessings. And so the theme then is don't forget Reuven. Make sure that he's included. Make sure that he's counted among his brothers. And this is the message of Proverbs 31, um, that it's a message of inclusion. Right? There's going to be joy for the last day. Uh, because her husband is going to be counted among the elders. You say, well, where does that happen? Well, in Revelation, if you remember, they set up thrones for judgment. And we know that Yeshua is also set up on a throne. Okay, so that'll give you a good start on that one. Let's go to the next blessing. Let's go to Judah. It says, hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah, and restore him to his people, though his own hands strive for him, help him against his foes. All right, so elements here, the voice of Judah, return or restoration, uh, hands fighting because of a grievance, 
and having help against his enemies, right? Uh, and, and the hands striving for him against his foes. The implication there is that fighting for the sake of righteousness, fighting for the sake of righteousness. All right, so let's go back to our Proverbs 31, to our wife here. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life, clearly making those choices for good versus evil, that there will be striving. It has to come with striving if you're going to overcome evil. It says she looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in the light. What does she do? She works with her hands. What does Judah do? He works with his hands. Uh, 14. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. This is seen as a, a, a way of saying the food, remember, is the doctrine. The, the bread is the food. It's the word. She brings her word from afar. What does that mean? It means that she is able to collect all sorts of insights into the word. And if you know that about Jewish scholarship, they have scholars from all over the world and they bring the, the collections of those insights into the word, just like the Proverbs 31 woman. Um, let's see, I'd love to say something there about the wool and the flax, but, but we'll press on because I know we won't make it through all of them. Uh, verse 17, she girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Right. This again relates back to Judah. His hands have to fight over the grievance. What is she doing? She's strengthening her hands. Uh, verse 19, she stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. She's still working with her hands. She's very busy. It has something to know about her. She's very busy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Right. Um, so the, the insight here is that snow represents judgment. It goes back to a verse in Job where he says he's reserved storehouses of snow against the day of judgment. Snow, hail, frozen water is seen as um, not just coming from the north, but also is damaging, part of punishment, part of judgment. And it says she's not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. Scarlet has a couple of implications there. Scarlet can mean a redemption price. It was part of the colors of the, the tabernacle and the temple, but it also represents redemption. It represents redemption. And so because her house is covered in redemption because her house is tabernacled, we might say, because it talks about how she spins the wool and the flax, very similar to the way that the tabernacle was spun by the wise women in the wilderness. She's not concerned of judgment because she's in the her household is in the tabernacle. They're covered in the scarlet. They're covered in the redemption price. They, and, and it's that particular color is seen as warming too. Uh, 21, anything else there? We got that one. 26, she opens her mouth in wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Um, what are we supposed to hear? The voice of Judah. She's supposed to be heard just as Judah's voice is going to be heard. Her Torah, it says literally the Torah of kindness is on her tongue. So just like Hannah, we're supposed to listen to her proclaim the gospel of Yeshua. Uh, 26, we got that one. Uh, 30 through 31, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Well, what does Judah's name mean? Praise, right? Give her the product of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. Uh, well, again here, 
her deeds and her fruits are going to return to her. What has she been doing? She has been proclaiming, not just through the spirit, not just through Yerat Adonai or the fear of Adonai that it specifically mentions, but remember her food. She's teaching doctrine. She's supplying the household with doctrine, good doctrine. And it says, because of this, you need to give her the fruit of her hands. Because if we are teaching the Torah, if we are teaching the word, then it should be yielding fruit. And it says this work that she has put in to cover her household with the word, give her the fruit of that. Uh, she's supposed to be praised for this. And that was what was said of Judah. It was a, his name was a matter of praise. Uh, the Torah of kindness was on her tongue. Okay, let's look at another one here right quick. How about Levi? Levi is verses 8 through 11. It says, of Levi, he said, let your Tumim and your Urim be with your faithful one, whom you tested at Massah, challenged at the waters of Meribah, who said of his father and mother, I consider them not. His brothers he disregarded, ignored his own children, your precepts alone they observed and kept your covenant. They shall teach your laws to Jacob and your instructions to Israel. They shall offer you incense to savor and whole offerings on your altar. Bless the Lord his substance and favor his undertakings. Smite the loins of his foes. Let his enemies rise no more. That is, I think, might be, other than Joseph, that might be the longest blessing in terms of space. It takes up a lot of space on the page. All right, so we've got a blessing here of the Urim and the Tumim, which is the perfections and the lights, which Urim would be the lights, Tumim would be the perfections. Uh, a blessing of observing the word in the covenant teaching the ordinances and the Torah. Uh, he places the incense and the burnt offerings on the altar. His resources will be blessed. The work of his hand will be blessed. He will smash the loins of his enemies and his enemies will not rise. So how do we connect that here back to our, our daughters of Asher, our daughters of the spirit? Well, Let's go to verse 15. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. Well, this is symbolic again of Torah and prophecy. Uh, giving food to the household, feeding the This is what Yeshua did. He fed his household. He even did miracles with bread to feed his household like Moses was associated with the manna. He fed the household. With the word, Moses not only fed the word, he was part of this process where the manna was seen to have fallen in his merit, representing the word from heaven. Uh, she girds her own loins. Well, remember, the Levites had to do this. Uh, this was part of their blessing is not just the services. They had to remember they had to wear a belt. They had to wear a sash in order to gird their loins, um, to give them that sense of mission, to give them that sense of authority. Well, this proverb woman, Proverbs woman, she knows her own authority. She knows the authorities that she has. I'm sure like uh, Hannah did in the temple. She wasn't just, you know, a singleton out there wandering around the temple. You know, she wasn't, uh, <laughs> she wasn't homeless. <laughs> She was there on purpose, and she was there with the validation of the temple authorities. You don't do anything in the temple that they don't allow you to do. They have policemen there. They have temple guards. So they're not just going to let old ladies hang out and bother everybody, but if they're there with a purpose, if they have a mission, if they have spiritual authority to do what they're doing, they're probably glad to have her to be there with the prayer and the fasting. And so she's not a Levitical priest, 
but she was a royal priest. She was doing a specific work in the house of Adonai. She was working in the natural realm under the authority of the priesthood and the Levites. But what authority was she working under in the spiritual realm? Under the authority of the Holy One. So she girds her own loins, uh, just like the, the Levites. They would go trim the menorah, refill the menorah, and do the incense service. And these are seen as tied together as offering prayers on behalf of the nation. This is exactly what Hannah was doing, offering prayers on behalf of the nation. She was doing the work of the menorah and the incense altar, but not in the holy place. Uh, the Torah is on her tongue. It says the Torah is on her tongue. And she has these surpassing achievements. She has these perfections. Uh, that's all you could say about her, really. In terms of her perfection, uh, it also says she considers a field and buys it from her earnings. She plants a vineyard, right? So what is she doing? She's taking the blessing from the work of her hands and she's reinvesting it. What did Hannah do? She took the infant Yeshua. She sees the blessing that he is on Israel and when she, she reinvests the word. She takes the word in and then she reinvests the word and starts preaching the redemption to those who are looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. She's planting a vineyard. And remember, the vineyard is associated with Israel, by the way. Uh, so not just girding herself with strength and making her arms strong. Uh, she makes coverings for herself in verse 22. Her clothing is fine linen and purple, okay? Like the priesthood, but not the Levitical priesthood. What are these coverings? Again, remember, it was the wise women who spun the coverings for the tabernacle. Uh, she's doing this. She's doing a priestly work, but not necessarily a priestly. Remember, the blessing is from sons. She's not a Levite, but based on the Levitical template, she's doing priestly work. Uh, what was the next one? 26. She opens her mouth in wisdom. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. That was part of the responsibilities of the Levites was to teach the Torah, to teach the ordinances, to teach the Torah. Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. You excel them all. We can see that the, the praise is very much a part of the blessing of Levi. He's being held up as, you know, uh, an example of having not even regarded his own family when it came to the golden calf. If, if you messed up in the golden calf, the tribe of Levi was coming after you with a sword. No nonsense. Kind of sounds like Hana, doesn't it? No nonsense at all. Uh, and then... What was there? 31. Give her the product of her hands. Let her works praise her in the gates. Uh, again, uh, she's being praised for her courage, like Levi. Being known in the gates is being known in places of decision, judgment, and importance. And surely, Hannah is known for this because she's one of the quote-unquote gatekeepers. Shimon, the priest, and then Hannah, the royal priest, not a Levitical priest. All right, let's take another one here. Benjamin. Kind of short here. It says, of Benjamin, he said, beloved of the Lord, he rests securely beside him. Ever does he protect him as he rests between his shoulders. Um, it's kind of a comfort that overriding blessing of Benjamin's comfort, because we know the, the temple itself was located in Benjamin's territory. And that was the way of speaking about Benjamin as he rested between Judah's shoulders. So because of the strength of Judah and the blessing of Judah, there was a security there for Benjamin as well, especially because of the location of the temple being there. Uh, verse 12, she does him good. 
Well, let's back up one. The heart of her husband trusts her. He will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. There's a sense of security there. And we can see that's a blessing from Benjamin is a sense of secure dwelling. Uh, not only in the case of the Proverbs woman, it's not as though she's dwelling securely in her husband, even though she does. It's in this case, it says he's dwelling securely because of her, because of what she does. Right, Joseph. Uh, the do. Um, do also represents doctrine. It says of Joseph, he said, blessed of the Lord be his land with the bounty of dew from heaven and of the deep that couches below <clears throat> with the bounteous yield of the sun and the bounteous crop of the moons with the best from the ancient mountains and the bounty of hills immemorial with the bounty of earth in its fullness and the favor of the presence in the bush. May these rest on the head of Joseph, on the crown of the elect of his brothers, like a firstling bull in his majesty. He has horns like the horns of the wild ox. With them he gores the peoples, the ends of the earth, one and all. These are the myriads of Ephraim. Those are the thousands of Menashe. All right, so pretty extensive. Do we? have anything that that might match it well it, it makes a curious statement here it says um where did it go i lost it there it is verse 14 with the bounteous yield of the sun and the bounteous crop of the moons that's interesting because it says about the proverbs woman she rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. So everything we know about her, she's not just busy during the day, she's busy all night too. Well, not all night, but she's getting up in the night. And so this is a, a blessing on Joseph. There's this industry of being prepared morning and evening, which is an apocalyptic sort of thing, because as you get into the New Testament, you realize the apostles are warning us, Yeshua's warning us, um, don't go to sleep. Uh, he, he says, like, if I come in the second watch of the night or even the third, right? He, he's telling us you be spiritually aware. It doesn't mean you can't ever go to sleep. He's telling you remain spiritually aware, which is what is being said here of the Proverbs woman. Uh, what else here? Of course, the crops, it mentions here that she considers a field and buys it. Uh, 21 and 22. Again, uh, she's not afraid of the judgment. Well, here it says the favor of the presence in the bush. May these rest on the head of Joseph. You know, it was a frightening thing, but nevertheless, he was favored. And we get this idea she's not afraid of the snow because she's she's covered. She's favored with that covering. Oh, what else? Um, 22, 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she smiles at the future. Well, Joseph has horns like the horns of the wild ox. He gores the peoples, the ends of the earth, one and all. Uh, so again, she's part of this. She has strength. Um, like the, the more literal strength of Joseph that we, we would envision is being matched over here by her spiritual strength. Uh, she's a strong, spiritually strong woman. Right? Um, I like that strength and dignity are her clothing. That's pretty cool. Um, 18. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. That makes me think too of Levi, because uh, when the priests would go in and trim the lamps, um, they didn't go out at night. It was so they would stay lit all night. Uh, but the 
the good gain. We see here the bounteous crops that she's bringing in. So there's their little match right there. Her children rise up and bless her. Well, what happens over here? It mentions the children of Joseph, Ephraim and Menashe, that they are blessed with the myriads and the thousands. And we could probably just keep going through this. Um, I don't know if you want to do that. Because I, I don't have a chat box. I can't see what you're saying back to me. So I don't know if you want to keep going or if you want to stop. So I guess I just make a call right here. And uh, <laughs> I guess we keep going, right? Okay. So the next one is going to be Zebulun, Zebulun, in verse 18, of Zebulun, he said, rejoice, O Zebulun, on your journeys, and Issachar in your tents. These two are always, just try it, any list of the tribes, because they'll change from place to place in scripture. Like I said, where they're mentioned in scripture, it has a context. He's, he's, your, your challenge when you see different lists of the tribes, it's not to arrive at the good list, it's to recognize the context of that list so you'll get the kind of the second story of, of what he's saying, right? But sometimes it might be like, uh, count your warriors. Well, in that context, you know it's for war. Um, and th there'll be other reasons to count, but that's that's one reason why you'll see the, the order mixed up. Uh, okay, so Zebulun and Issachar, they're always together. It doesn't matter which list you go to, they're pretty much together. And uh, they must have been that tight as two tribes. They must have been very much alike. And of course, you know, what the rabbis say about these two is that Issachar were the studiers, they were the scholars. Zebulun were good at commerce. And so Zebulun would go out and, and they would expend the effort to go out in commercial activity to make the money. And then they would support the Torah scholars among Issachar because Issachar was of the tents. Like Jacob, he was a man of the tents. He's a man who liked to study. And so if you study right, then you do right. And you need both. You need the ability to study, but you need the ability to apply. And so with Zebulun, the Torah was very practical, going out and doing it. But how did they know how to do it? Well, they were in a partnership with Issachar. And Issachar, as they study the word, they get down the layers, the layers. It's always about studying the layers. And as they uncover something, they say, hey, Zebulun, this is the application. Mm -hmm. So they had great scholars in Issachar. But a scholar, if you're going to be a scholar, um, you need help, typically. You're, you're, if you throw yourself into, say, a business like Zebulun did, you're going to be too exhausted to study. You're not going to have the energy left to study. What you need is, you know, a sideline <laughs> to keep you going. Uh, I guess that's what I've got is a sideline. But uh, it, it takes the two. If, if you're going to study at that depth, if you're going to have schools and things like that, you need people to throw their energy into those things. But then you need people there to support those endeavors. So that's why you see these two. Uh, together a lot. And their, their blessings really are tied together right here in the text. So of Zebulun, he said, rejoice, O Zebulun, on your journeys, and Issachar in your tents. They invite their kin to the mountain, where they offer sacrifices of success, where they draw from the riches of the sea and the hidden hordes of the sand. So you can't even separate their blessing out right here. It's just like the rest of scripture. I know, weird things fascinate me. Um, but there's value here. 
uh, success, there's riches, there's success, the riches of the sea. Well, what's one of the biggest riches of the sea? Pearls. Pearls, like pearly gates, pearls. What, what do we know about the Proverbs woman? Uh, well, we get the idea in verse 11, the heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. He's going to be a successful person. What do we know about Zebulun and Issachar? Because they were partners, they were successful. As long as they stayed partners, they were successful. They had no lack of gain. So she's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. That's what Zebulun did. They had the merchant ships. And they bring the food from afar. Again, what does that mean? It, it's that diversity of uh, ideas about the Torah text itself, because we're still doing that today. That hasn't stopped. Since the Torah was given at Sinai, we're still trying to unpack the Torah and find those hidden treasures. And part of the beauty of it uh, is that, again, even though Israel was scattered, she is constant continued to study in the nations of her scattering. And so when she comes back to the land, she comes back with a perspective. And in that sense, it's very tasty food. It's just like, hey, there's kosher Mexican food. Hey, there's kosher Thai food. Hey, no matter where you go, you, you don't have to take the worst of those places, you take the best of those places, and it adds to this um, bride of Messiah as Israel, and all of a sudden, she's bringing her food from afar, and it's still good food. It's still kosher food, right? It's not just the word, but it's people who have ingested that word, and they've begun obeying that word, and so somebody from Thailand, as they learn the Torah, and they turn to Yeshua, what do they, they become this uh, kosher treasure that can be brought back to Jerusalem. And it's going to have the flavor of Thailand, of that nation. And, you know, the, the flavor of Peru or the flavor of Japan. And it'll, I'll be kosher in this partnership like, I wouldn't mind being a part of that tribe. Uh, but again, remember, with these tribes, it's understood they all share in the blessings, each blessing. But it's going to be characteristic more of certain tribes. Uh, what else? She opens her mouth in wisdom. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. That's thought to be Issachar, uh, the one who does the teaching because they do the studying. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. What's happening here, she's making the linen garments. Remember that we have a garment of salvation, but we also have garments of righteousness, linen garments of righteousness. And she supplies the belts that go with them. Remember the authority? symbolized by the sash or the belt, the sense of mission and purpose. As Zebulun goes out and proclaims the gospel to the nations, what does he do? Well, because of Issachar, he can supply the nations with these uh, treasures of the Torah, with the righteousness of the Torah, the righteousness of Yeshua. Remember, Yeshua is the one who's girt about also. So we, we're giving them the authority of Yeshua, the authority of the word, a sense of purpose and mission as Israel. That's a rich blessing right there. Let's do another one. Issachar. We say, well, what happened to Issachar? You just got tense. That's okay. That's okay. Because if we understand that the tents again, reflect Torah study, um, that's, that's the read that the rabbis got from Jacob when they said he was a man of the tents. And they believe that there's, what, 11 or 12 missing? in the life of Jacob, and they believe that he studied with Shem in Shalem or Jerusalem. It, today it would be Jerusalem back then, it would have been called Shalem. And they believe that he studied with Shem during that period, those, those missing years. All right, so the tents, um, she looks for wool 
and flax and works with her hands in the light. Remember the wise women, they spun the tent, the tabernacle, the mishkan, and they spun it with wool. They used wool to do it. She stretches out her hands to the distaff and her hands grasp the spindle. That's part of the spinning process. And then it says she opens her mouth in wisdom. The teaching of kindness is on her tongue. Remember Issachar, they studied. They would find the best applications of the word. And then Zebulun could take it out into the nations. It's kind of a like a, a missionary blessing almost. Okay, God in verse 20, it says of God, he said, blessed be he who enlarges Gad. Poised is he like a lion to tear off arm and scalp. He chose for himself the best, for there is the portion of the revered chieftain, for the heads of the people come. He executed the Lord's judgments and his decisions for Israel. Okay, that's a pretty hefty blessing in terms of the real estate, not like Joseph. Uh, not like Levi, but still, we can see there's nothing much that's changed with Gad. He was part of the shock troops. He, he would be the first soldiers into battle. Uh, he, he still identified there with the shock troops, very strong. right? Um, and again, try it in different translations. Um, but we see here, blessed be he who enlarges God, right? This is what we see the Proverbs woman doing. She's broadening her influence, both in her own household with the coverings and with the food of her household. But we see that she goes from the household out into the vineyard. She goes out and she, she plants a vineyard. She takes the garments and the belts uh, of righteousness out to the tradesmen. Again, so that it can be passed out there into the world, like Zebulun and Issachar. Uh, and so, blessed be he who enlarges God. God is also going to be broadened. He's also going to enlarge his influence. Uh, he strengthens his arms and loins uh, because he's a he's a soldier. He has a soldier's attitude. And Gad actually means troop, like a troop of soldiers. Not lazy at all. Again, built homes for their, their families. They built pens for their livestock. And then they dedicated the next several years to being at the, the vanguard of the Israelite armies as they went in to get their territories. Uh, this is very much a ministry of... I wouldn't say mission work, but mission work in the sense that God is not afraid to set something up, to risk uh, being at the forefront of something. If he sees a good work, he will be right out there doing it. Just like she sees a vineyard, she's like, that's a good vineyard. That's a good place for a vineyard. I'm going to go plant a vineyard there. That's the attitude of God. He says, that's an opportunity. That's a spiritual opportunity. I'm going to go do it. And when he does that, he broadens, just like she does. She broadens, she gets a vineyard. She broadens, she sends these products out into the world. She broadens, she extends her hand to the poor and to the needy. Apparently, the, the Gadites uh, were such good soldiers that it, it would have been a real problem for the rest of the tribes to conquer their territories without him. Uh, so uh, very helpful in that sense of personal sacrifice on behalf of others, uh, able to anticipate a need and, and just kind of go out there and take care of it. Um, and often I would say that the, the Gadites are underappreciated. The Gadites are underappreciated. Uh, they're more appreciated when you're in a bind and you need something. But once you get your territory, once you can sit down and rest, you tend to forget the Gadites. 
uh, but his influence is still there uh, because he was willing to, to broaden, to, to extend himself. And it says, poised to see like a lion to tear off arm and scalp. Something I read somewhere else. It might have been in that tribal book. Um, the arm and the scalp refer to where the tefillin are put on. Remember, you, you shall put them as a sign on your head and on your arm. Well, the, the arm is where you put one of them. The head is where you put the other. The arm and the head, the, there is protection there. If you will walk in his word, there is protection. What if you don't have protection? In other words, what if you're a wicked person? What if you're not walking in the word? God is not afraid to tear off your arm and your scalp <laughs> if you're a wicked person. It says he chose for himself the best. Uh, for there is the portion of the revered chieftain for the heads of the people come. He executed the Lord's judgments and his de decisions for Israel. Obviously, there's a lot more there to unpack. Um, but for the sake of time, it says she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. That is God. God does not eat the bread of idleness. He's always doing something, whether he's tearing off the arm and the head uh, or developing the best portions, choosing the first. Why does he choose the first plot of land? Because he can see. He thinks with the front part of his brain. A lot of people don't. He sees, hey, I'm a shepherd. This is good pasture. I need to develop this. Looks ahead. Right? We, we need to have that blessing for sure. And this is what we see of the, the Proverbs woman. It says, her house has no fear of the snow because they're all covered in scarlet. They're not covered in scarlet because she just thought about it after it started snowing. She thought about it long before it started snowing. Let's see. Um, of Dan. He said, Dan is a lion's whelp that leaps forth from Bashan. Right, that lion's whelp. Um, again, we, we've been talking about the lion's whelp, the cub, the lion, and the lioness. Dan, uh, th there's an element here of spiritual immaturity that, that might be, he's like a child that says, leaping from Bashan. Uh, we might have to go up into the upper part of Proverbs 31, back into verses 8 and 9 to really get a handle on that. I don't want to take the time to do that today. Um, but where it says she extends her hand to the poor, she stretches out her hands to the needy. I think we get an example of this from Samson or Shimshon. Remember, he had this whole riddle with the lion. <laughs> uh, but leaping forth from Bashan, the idea is when you need help, he leaps out. And that's what we could say about Samson in a time when Israel was in a state of poverty and, and neediness. That's when he stepped up as a judge. Did he have some issues? Certainly he did. And in fact, Don is missing in the list in Revelation. Doesn't mean he's not there. He is because the text clearly tells you they're all there. He's just not listed by name, and neither is Ephraim. Menashe is named. Joseph is named. Menashe is excluded. Don is excluded by name, but not by presence. They're both there. Why would you exclude those two names? Because this is where the alternate altars of the golden calves were set up in the northern kingdom. And that's why I say pay attention to your context. You know by who's missing what the point is being made right there. When it talks about the 144,000, it talks about them being virgins, being spiritually pure. Well, the two tribes who we can associate with not being virgins <laughs> in the spiritual sense are going to be Dan and Ephraim because those altars were set up in their territories. Doesn't mean they're excluded. It means in that list, 
you need to understand it's representing the spiritual purity that Israel has recovered. Okay, which that's kind of a side trail for us. Almost done. Of Naphtali, he said, O oh, Naphtali, sated with favor and full of the Lord's blessing, take possession on the west and the south. Take possession on the west and on the south. Um, some translations will say the sea because the west and the sea are kind of the same thing at this particular time. If you go west, that's the Mediterranean Sea. So that is the west and the sea. Okay, so the sea and the south. Um, again, that um, reminds us of the pearls. Her that says her worth is far above jewels. Uh, again, the blessing. Her worth is far above jewels. Jewels or, uh, yeah, jewels. If we go back to Mount Sinai, if you'll remember, after the people sinned with the golden calf, Moses made them take off their jewelry, their jewelry, their adi. Jewelry is seen as something for a bride. And so uh, with naphtali, these, uh, these blessings of the sea, like the pearls, the jewels, um, that would be part, again, of righteous deeds. The south uh, is seen as a place of favor because the damaging uh, hail, rain, snow, was seen as coming out of the direction of the north, but from the south drew dews and the light rains. And it was symbol symbol symbolic also of resurrection, like renewal. So Naphtali is going to have that, that sense of um, renewal. Again, with the sea, the merchandise. We see her bringing her merchandise from afar. We see her selling her merchandise into faraway places. Um, and then, you know, and with Naphtali, if we, if we took the other set of blessings given by uh, Jacob, it would enhance this even more. But we see Naphtali, he gets beautiful words, beautiful words. Well, what do beautiful words do? They give life, they, they resurrect you. When you're in a low place, if somebody quotes the right scriptures, with favor, it's like a resurrection from the dead. Uh, where they say a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and frames of silver. That's what it says in Proverbs. And Naphtali knows how to, uh, not necessarily like Issachar, do that deep, 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 deep teaching, even though there are the treasures of the sea there. Uh, it's fitly spoken words fitly spoken words. And there's also a sense of blessing too, that because the words are so good, there's a diplomatic element to this because in the other blessing, remember he's like on the mountain, he's like a hind on the mountains. Well, mountains represent peoples. And so the blessing of Nafti, Naftali, give the beautiful words, but not just to your own household, to send those beautiful words out to the mountains, out to the peoples. The sea also represents the peoples, the sea and the mountains. And so that, that diplomatic, knowing the right words to say, because we can have every word of the Torah in our heads, but if we don't know the right time to say it, if we don't know how to package and place the words in the proper situation, we, we don't get the result of blessing. Um, Let's see. And the, the last one, the one that, of course, we were been studying is the, the blessing on Asher as the blessing of daughters. Um, of Asher, he said, most blessed of sons be Asher. May he be the favorite of his brothers. May he dip his foot in oil. May your door bolts be iron and copper. 
and your security last all your days. And so there's another element of Asher that we'll talk about maybe next week, the, the iron and copper locks. What does that mean? Um, but he's the most blessed, blessed from sons, plenty of olive oil, um, but also sealed in security and purity into old age. There's no fear of old age in the tribe of Asher. Asher just gets better and better with age. Better and better with age. I mean, what a blessing, right? Just like Hana in the temple, better and better. Age 84, most, you know, <laughs> I get tired now. But she was 84 and she's still just serving night and day in the temple with fastings and prayers. Uh, so it's like she has a blessing of youth into her old age. She's so active in the kingdom in her old age. And she's pure. And that's what I'm going to talk about next week is the purity of Asher as a sealed garden. That she maintains a security of her purity. She holds on to it. She's not the in and out, up and down. And it, if you're in and out and up and down, uh, <laughs> you don't give up, right? It's better to be in and out, up and down than just out. But you need to start praying for the blessing of the tribe of Asher, which is a constancy that you just get better with age. You get younger with age. You serve more with age. You get more single-minded with age. And instead of becoming more unstable with the passing of time, you have your feet firmly planted in the temple with the passing of time. All right, that was a lot of information to cover, I know. It was a lot of information to cover, but next week we'll try to wrap up our share because if you've still got your Bible open, uh, you can see by putting Asher last, which is not where he goes, in, in birth order, this is out of order. And some of these others are out of order too. But Asher specifically, by being placed last, most blessed of sons, he will be blessed from sons. If you keep reading, it goes straight into the majesty of Adonai. Asher is directly linked to the majesty of Adonai. It says, oh, Yeshurun, there is none like God riding through the heavens to help you, through the skies in his majesty. The ancient God is a refuge, a support are the arms everlasting. He drove out the enemy before you by his command, destroy. Thus, Israel dwells in safety, untroubled as Jacob's abode, in a land of grain and wine under heaven's dripping dew. Oh, happy Israel, who is like you, a people delivered by the Lord, your protecting shield, your sword triumphant, your enemy shall come cringing before you, and you shall tread on their backs. So if we take all of these blessings of the 12 tribes, and we match them up with these spiritual blessings of the daughters in Proverbs 31, we can see the, the complement, not just that, you know, Adonai himself is the source of these blessings because he's doing everything that these blessings say. It also opens with that. If you look in chapter 33, it also opens with where the blessings come from, where it says this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, bade the Israelites farewell before he died. It says, the Lord came from Sinai. He shone upon them from Seir. He appeared from Mount Paran and approached from Rebobot Kodesh, lightning flat, flashing at them from his right. Lover indeed of a people, they're holy, all in your hand. They followed in your steps, accepting your pronouncements when Moses charged us with the teaching as the heritage of the congregation of Jacob. Then he became king and Yeshurun when the heads of the people assembled the tribes of Israel, together, together. So the blessings on these tribes are the tribes of Israel together. 
it makes them one people together. Just like with the, the tribe of Asher showing us how the male and the female, they're different, but they're together. They have their own blessings, but they're together. The natural and the spiritual, together. That's the, that's the unity of Adonai. That's the Echad. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. He's one. And these blessings right here show us the unity. So when he teaches us in the twins and the pairs to listen for the footsteps of Messiah, then I think not only is he telling us that once again, the, the natural and the spiritual, we'll, we'll see it bonding back together. I think you'll also see the, the principles of the, the male and the female, the spirit poured out together. It, it had a good start and then it, took a nosedive. <laughs> a couple of generations later, took a big nosedive. But he's restoring the Torah to us. He's restoring the daughters of Israel to, you know, he's restoring the blessings upon the tribes. He's forming them into one. He's doing all the work that needs to be done. We just have to walk in it. Okay. Alan gave me his phone so I can see what you said. <laughs> About ran out of a voice on you today. I don't know why. You can see the chat and I can't. Really odd. And I hope you do. I, I hope, you know, if you attend a Bible study this week or whatever it is that you do, I hope you'll look for more links between Proverbs 31 and the blessings on the sons. In fact, we didn't even touch on the blessings of Jacob. So if you pull in those blessings on the 12 tribes from Jacob, you'll get more stuff. Let's see. Why does Naphtali have to take possession of the south and the west, yet inhabits the north and the east of their tribe placement? Good question. That's why I say it, it's worthwhile to map out every list of the tribes, the 12 tribes. And it's also good to put side by side Joshua's tribal emplacements versus Ezekiel's tribal emplacements. Not because it'll give you any answers. It'll probably give you more questions. Uh, but the thing to remember about, let's see if I've got one here. Yeah, the thing to remember about this encampment is that changes in Revelation. This was for a specific purpose in a specific place. And if the wilderness represents the peoples, Remember the wilderness of Egypt, the wilderness of the peoples? This probably represents something more specific to the dispersion, the diaspora, than what we will read in terms of Israel being settled into their, their tribal inheritances. Um, different things going on there. So instead of everyone trying to figure out what tribe they are, <laughs> We should be focused more on how we can practice the discipline of receiving each of the tribes. Definitely. Definitely. It's just like this. This is a smaller scale than 12. There's seven manifestations of the spirit of Adonai. But it's one Holy Spirit. So nobody I know is just going to pray and say, oh, Father, just give me the spirit of counsel. Just give me the spirit of counsel you might pray for an extra measure of the spirit of counsel in a particular situation, but it's not to the exclusion of any other manifestation. Because the truth is, you might be praying for counsel, and he's like, you need wisdom. You, you're not even going to know how to take counsel until you go back and get some wisdom and understanding. And that's why, you know, there's, a, there's one Holy Spirit. We can pray, yes, for specific manifestations, but in the long run say, hey, I need it all. 
I need every bit of it because it doesn't do me any good to ask for counsel if I don't have reverence. I want reverence what you say anyway. Um, good call there, good call. Yeah, I, I think the if we pray, and if, if it's like they're saying that each of these blessings, every son had them in some measure. It's just that stronger measures went to certain sons or certain tribes. That's the thing to remember. You might have, you know, a, a, tri, a, a blessing of scholarship. It doesn't mean you don't need to know how to pick up the sword in a particular situation, like the sword of the word. Uh, just studying how to do things, halakha or something like that, you can get so, you know, magnetized to that, you don't even know how to act. We see that a lot. Uh, so you need, you do pray for it all in its proper time. And if you prepare for it all, I think what we're told in the breed is that don't worry about it. When the time comes, he'll put the words in your mouth or he'll say, go this way, walk this way. You'll have the answers. Yeah, that you, you can get into a rough place there if you're just trying to figure out what tribe you're from and just do those characteristics because you're going to need them all at some point. And the thing is, unless you do have some genealogy back there, you, you may or may not be physically descended, but you don't have to worry about it because in Ezekiel, there's it's understood. There, there's provision made. It doesn't matter if you're natural born or a child of Abraham. There's provision made. If you don't have lineage, you settle in whatever territory you want. If you do have lineage, then the understanding is Elijah assigns you. He'll tell you if you do have lineage, as you come in, he'll say, you're this tribe, there's your lot. So it kind of locks you in. It might be better to just come as a child of Abraham and look around and pick which territory you want. So I'm feeling pretty Naphtali today. And if you'll notice too in the Ezekiel allotment, uh, God and these other tribes that are that were on the eastern side of the Jordan, they fall down into the vineyard. So instead of being totally on the other side of the Jordan, they would have territory that went all the way across. So there's more of an equality there. Okay, that's all I got. <laughs> we made it. We made it back home today. Uh, been celebrating our 40th anniversary today, June 17th. Okay, so this chat box should be lighting up and you should all be saying, you don't look that old. <laughs> you lost your opportunity. It was a moment. It's too late. I'm just kidding. We had a blast. It was good to get away from the kids for a few days. <laughs> we, know we love this baby. All right, guys. Um, We're going to try to get unpacked here in a little bit. Uh, so I'll say goodbye and thanks for joining in. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's too late to tell me I don't look that old. Too late. It was a moment. <laughs> yes, I was seven when I got married. Uh, What uh, Tara say? She said, you made it through the wilderness. So good things ahead, Canaanite kings. <laughs> That's all right. We've got all these blessings to work with, right? We've got the tribe of God going before us and uh, we'll make it, we'll make it. All right, thanks for celebrating with us. We're counting this as part of the celebration. So uh, whatever your year, year is 
uh, or whatever your your spiritual birthday or your spiritual anniversary might be blessings to you and congratulations and i just pray that you can grow each year and uh we love you and we'll see you next week bye bye